chapter 5, pages 75 to 91. Killing each separate louse is a tedious business when a man has hundreds. The little beasts are hard, and the everlasting cracking with one's fingernails soon become, very soon becomes wearisome. So Chadan has rigged up the lid of a boot polish tin with a piece of wire over the lighted stump of a candle. The lice are simply thrown into this little pan. Crack! And they're done for. We sit around with our shirts on our knees, our bodies naked in the warm air, and our hands at work. Hai has a particularly fine brand of louse. They have a red cross on their heads. He suggests that he brought them back from the hospital at Thorhout, where they attended personally a surgeon general. He says he means to use the fat that slowly accumulates in the tin lid for polishing his boots and roars with laughter for a half an hour at his own joke. But he gets little response today. We are too preoccupied with another affair. The rumor has materialized. Himmelstoss has come. He appeared yesterday. We've already heard the well-known voice. He seems to have overdone it with a couple of young recruits on the plowed field at home. And unknown to him, the son of the local magistrate was watching. That cooked his goose. We will get some surprise here. Chadden has been meditating for hours what to say to him. High gazes thoughtfully at his great paws and winks at me. The thrashing was the high water mark of his life. He tells me he often dreams of it. Krop and Mueller are amusing themselves. From somewhere or other, probably the pioneer cookhouse, Krop has bagged for himself a mess tin full of beans. Mueller squints hungrily into it, but checks himself and says, Albert, what would you, sudden, what would you do if there were suddenly peacetime again? There won't be any peacetime, says Albert bluntly. Well, but if, persists Mueller, what would you do? Clear out of this, growls Cop. Of course, and then what? Get drunk, says Albert. Don't talk rot, I mean seriously. So do I, says Crop. What else should a man do? Cat becomes interested. He levies tribute on Crop's tin of beans, swallows some, then considers for a while and says, You might get drunk first, of course, but then you'd take the next train for home and mother. Peacetime, man. Albert. He fumbles on his oilcloth pocketbook for a photograph and suddenly shows it all around. My old woman. Then he puts it back and swears. Damn lousy war. It's all very well for you to talk, I tell him. You've a wife and children. True, he nods. And I have to see to it that they have, they have something to eat. We laugh. They won't lack for that cat. You'd scrounge it from somewhere. Mueller is insatiable and gives himself no peace. He wakes High Westus out of his dream. Hi, what would you do if it was peacetime? Give you a kick in the backside for the way you talk, I say. How does it come about exactly? How does this cow shit come on the roof? Retorts Mueller laconically and turns to High Westus again. It is too much for High. He shakes his freckled head. You mean when the war's over? Exactly, you've said it. Will there be women, of course, eh? High licks his lips. Sure. By Jove, yes, says High, his face melting. Then I'd, gra then I'd grab some good buxom dame, some real kitchen wench with plenty to get hold of, you know, and jump straight into bed. Just you think, boys, a real feather bed with a spring mattress. I wouldn't put trousers on again for a week. Everyone is silent. The picture is too good. Our flesh creeps. At last, Mueller pulls himself together and says, and then what? A pause. Then High explains rather awkwardly. If I were a non-com, I'd stay with the Prussians and serve out my time. Hi, you've got a screw loose, surely, I say. Uh, hi, you've, you've ever dug peat? He retorts good-naturedly. You try it. Then pull a spoon out of the top. Then pull a spoon out of the top of his boot and reaches over into Crop's mess tin. It can't be worse than digging trenches, I ventured. High chews and grins. It lasts longer, though, and there's no getting out of it either. But man, surely it's better at home. Some ways, says he, page 79, and with open mouth sinks into a daydream. You can see what he is thinking. There is the mean little hunt on the mo hut on the moors, the hard work on the heath from morning till night in the heat, the miserable pay, the dirty laborers' clothes. In the army, in peacetime, you've nothing to trouble about, he goes on. Your food's found every day or else you kick up a row. You've a bed, 
every week, clean underwear like a perfect gent. <laughs> you do your non-coms duty. You have a good suit of clothes. In the evening, you're a free man and go off to the pub. Kai is extraordinarily set on this his idea. He's in love with it. And when your 12 years are up, you get your pension and become the village bobby. And you can walk about the whole day. He's already sweating on it. And just you think how you'd be treated. Here a dram, there a pint. Everybody wants to be well in with a bobby. You'll never be a non-com, though, High interrupts Cap. High looks at him sadly and is silent. His thoughts still linger over the clear evenings in autumn, the Sundays and the heather, the village bells, the afternoons and evenings with the servant girls, the fried bacon and barley, the carefree hours in the alehouse. He can't part with all these dreams so abruptly. He merely growls. What silly questions you do ask. He pulls his shirt over his head and buttons up his tunic. What would you do, Chowden? asks Crop. Chowden thinks of one thing only. See to it that Himmelstas didn't get past me. Apparently, he would like most to have him in a cage and sail into him with every cl <laughs> with a club every morning. To Crop, he says warmly, If I were in your place, I'd see to it that I became a lieutenant. Then you could grind him till the water in his backside boils. And you, Dietering? asks Mueller like an inquisitor. He's a born schoolmaster with all his questions. Dietering is sparing with his words, but on this subject he speaks. He looks at the sky and says only one, the one sentence. I would go straight on with the harvesting. Then he gets up and walks off. He is worried. His wife has to look after the farm. They've already taken away two more of his horses. Every day he reads the papers that come, that come to see whether it is raining in his little corner of Oldenburg. They haven't brought in the hay yet. At this moment, Himmelstoss appears. He comes straight up to our group. Chodden's face turns red. He stretches his length on the grass and shuts his eyes ex in excitement. Himmelstoss is a little hesitant. His gait becomes slower. Then he marches up to us. No one makes any motion to stand up. Crop looks up at him with interest. He continues to stand in front of us and wait. And as no one says anything, he launches a, Well, a couple of seconds go by. Apparently Himmelstoss doesn't quite know what to do. He would like most to set us on the run again, but he seems to have learned already that the front line isn't a parade ground. He tries it on, though, and by addressing himself to one instead of all of us, hopes to get some response. Crop is nearest, so he favors him. Well, you here too? But Albert is no friend of his. A bit longer than you, I fancy, he retorts. The red mustache twitches. You don't recognize me anymore, what? Chodden now opens his eyes. I do, though. Himmelstoss turns to him. Chodden, isn't it? Chodden lifts his head. And do you know what you are? Himmelstoss is disconcerted. Since when have we become so familiar? I don't remember that we ever slept in the gutter together. He has no idea what to make of the situation. He didn't expect this open hostility, but he is on his guard. He has already had some rot dinned into him about getting a shot in the back. The question about the gutter makes Chodden so mad that he becomes almost witty. No, you slept there by yourself. Himmelstoss begins to boil, but Chodden gets in ahead of him. He must bring off his insult. Wouldn't you like to know what you are? A dirty hound. That's what you are. I've been wanting to tell you that for a long time. The satisfaction of mouths shines in his dull pig's eyes as he spits out, Dirty hound. Himmelstoss lets fly too now. What's that, you muckrake, you dirty peat stealer? Stand up there. Bring your heels together when your superior officer speaks to you. Chodden weighs him off. You take a run and jump at yourself, Himmelstoss. Himmelstoss is a raging book of army regulations. The Kaiser couldn't be more insulted. Chodden, I command you as your superior officer, stand up. Anything else you would like? asked Chodden. Will you obey my order or not? Chodden replies without knowing it in the well-known classical phrase. At the same time, he ventilates his backside. I'll have you court-martialed, storms Himmelstoss. We watch him disappear in the direction of the orderly room. High and shot and burst into a regular Pete Digger's bellow. High laughs so much that he dislocates his jaw and suddenly stands there helpless with his mouth wide open. Albert has to put it in again by giving it a blow with his fist. Cat is troubled. If he reports you, it'll be pretty serious. Do you think he will, asks Chodden? Sure too, I say. The least you'll get will be five days closer rest, says Cat. That doesn't worry Chodden. Five days clink or five days rest. And if they send you to the fortress, urges the thoroughgoing Mueller, 
Well, for the time being, the war will be over as far as I'm concerned. Chadna is a cheerful soul. There aren't any worries for him. He goes off with high and leer so that they won't find him in the first flush of excitement. Page 84. Mueller hasn't finished yet. He tackles Krop again. Albert, if you were really at home now, what would you do? Krop is contented now and more accommodating. How many of us were there in the class exactly? We count up. Out of 27 are dead. Four wounded, one in a madhouse. That makes 12. Three of them are lieutenants, says Mueller. Do you think they would still let Canterick sit on them? We guess not. We wouldn't let ourselves be sat on for that matter. What do you mean by the threefold theme in William Tell, says Crop reminiscently, and roars with laughter. What was the purpose of the poetic league of Gottingen, asked Mueller suddenly and earnestly. How many children has Charles the Bald? Bald, I interrupt gently. You'll never make anything of your life, Baumer, croaks Mueller. When was the Battle of Zana? Crop wants to know. You lack the studious mind, Crop. Sit down. Three minus, I say. What offices did Lycurgus consider the most important for the state? Asked Mueller, pretending to take off his pence nez. Does it go, we Germans fear God and none else in the whole world, or we the Germans fear God and, I submit, how many inhabitants has Melbourne? Asked Mueller. How do you expect to succeed in life if you don't know that? I ask Albert hotly, which he caps with, which, what is meant by cohesion? We remember mighty little of all that rubbish. Anyway, it was never been the slightest use to us. At school, nobody ever taught us how to light a cigarette in a storm of rain, nor how a fire could be made with wet wood, nor that it is best to stick a bayonet in the belly. There it doesn't get jammed as it does in the ribs. Mueller says thoughtfully, what's the use? We'll have to go back and sit on the forms again. I consider that out of the question. We might take a special exam. That needs preparation. And if you do get through, what then? A student's life isn't any better. If you have no money, you have to work like the devil. It's a bit better, but it's all it's rot all the same. Everything they teach you. Page 86. Crop supports me. How can a man take all that stuff seriously when he's out once been out here? Still, you must have an occupation of some sort, insists Mueller, as though he were Canterick himself. Albert cleans his nails with a knife. We are surprised at this delicacy, but it is merely pensiveness. He puts the knife away and continues. That's just it. Cat, Dietering, and High, they'll all go back to their jobs because they had them already. Himmelstoss too. But we never had any. How will we ever get used to one after this here? He makes a gesture towards the front. What we'll want is a private income, and then we'll be able to live by ourselves in a wood, I say. But at once, I feel ashamed of this absurd idea. What will really happen when we go back, wonders Mueller, and even he is troubled. Croc gives him a shrug. I don't know. Let's get back first. Then we'll find out. We are all utterly at a loss. What could we do, I ask? I don't want to do anything, replies Crop wearily. You'll be dead one day, so what does it matter? I don't think we'll ever go back. Page 87. When I think about it, Albert, I say, after a while rolling over on my back, when I hear the word peacetime, it goes to my head, and if it really came, I think I would do some unimaginable thing, something you know that it's worth having lain here in the muck for, but I can't even imagine anything. All I do know is that this business and about professions and studies and salaries and so on, it makes me sick. It is and always was disgusting. I don't see anything at all, Albert. All at once, everything seems to me confused and hopeless. Crop feels it, too. It will go pretty hard with us all, but nobody at home seems to worry much about it. Two years of shells and bombs. A man won't peel that off as easy as a sock. We agree that it's the same for everyone, not only for us here, but everywhere, for everyone who is our, our age. To some more and to others less, it is the common fate of our generation. Albert expresses it. The war has ruined us for everything. He is right. We are not youth any longer. We don't want to take the world by storm. We are fleeing. We fly from ourselves, from our life. We are 18 and had begun the first and had begun to love life and the world, and we had to shoot it to pieces. The first bomb, the first explosion, it bursts in our hearts. We are cut off from activity, from striving, from progress. We believe in such things no longer. We believe in the war. Page 88. The orderly room shows signs of life. 
Himmelstoss seems to have stirred them up. At the head of the column trots the fat sergeant major. It is queer that almost all of the regular sergeant majors are fat. Himmelstoss follows him, thirsting for vengeance. His boots gleam in the sun. We get up. Where's Chodden, the sergeant puffs? No one knows, of course. Himmelstoff glowers at us wrathfully. You know very well. You won't say. That's the fact of the matter. Out with it. Fatty looks round inquiringly, but Chodden is not to be seen. He tries another way. Chodden will report at the orderly room in ten minutes. Then he steams off with Himmelstoss in his wake. I have a feeling that next time we go up, the wiring will be... Up the up wiring, I'll be let I'll let a bundle of wire fall on Himmelstoss's leg. Hence, crap. We have quite a lot of joke. We'll have quite a lot of jokes with him. Laughs Mueller. That is our sole ambition: to knock the conceit out of a postman. I go into the hut and put Chodden wise. He disappears. Then we change our posse and lie down again to play cards. We know how to do that: to play cards, to swear, and to fight. Not much for twenty years, and yet too much for twenty years. Half an hour later, Himmelstoss is back again. No one pays attention to him. He asks for Chodden. We shrug our shoulders. Then you'd better find him, he persists. Haven't you been to look for him? Crop lies back on the grass and says, Have you been out there here before? That's none of your business, retorts Himmelstoss. I expect an answer. Very good, says Crop, getting up. See up there where those little white clouds are? Those are anti-aircraft. We were over there yesterday. Five dead and eight wounded. And that's a mere nothing. Next time when you go up with us, before they die, the fellows will come up to you. Click their heels and ask stiffly, Please may I go? Please may I hop it? We've been here a long time waiting for someone like you. Page 90. He sits down again and Himmelstoss disappears like a comet. Three days, CB conjectures Cap. Next time I'll let fly, I say to Albert. But that is the end. The case comes up for trial in the evening. In the orderly room sits our lieutenant, Bertink, and calls us in one after the other. I have to appear as a witness and explain the reason of Chodden's insubordination. The story of the bedwetting makes an impression. Himmelstoss is recalled, and I repeat my statement. Is that right, Bertink? asks Himmelstoss. He tries to evade the question, but in the end he has to confess, for Krop tells the same story. Why didn't someone report the matter then? asks Bertink. We are silent. He must know himself how much use it is to report in reporting such things. It isn't usual to make complaints in the army. He understands it all right, though, and lectures Himmelstoss. Oops. Lectures Himmelstoss, making it plain to him that the front isn't a parade ground. Then comes Chodden's turn. He gets a long sermon and three days open arrest. Bertink gives Crop a wink and one day's open arrest. It can't be helped, he says to him regretfully. He is a decent fellow. Open arrest is quite pleasant. The clink was once a foul house. There we can visit the prisoners. We know how to manage it. Close arrest would have meant the cellar. They used to tie it to us to a tree, but that is forbidden now. In many ways, we are treated quite like men. An hour later, ch after Chodden and Crop are settled in behind their wire netting, we make our way into them. Chodden greets us cowing, crowing. <laughs> then we play scat far into the night. Chodden wins, of course, the lucky wretch.